Coming up on Network Africa. Investigations on the way into a helicopter crash that killed Kenya's military chief. Heavy rains and flooding wreak havoc across East Africa, claiming lives and displacing thousands of people in Kenya and Tanzania. Plus, the Food and Agriculture Organization says hunger levels in Africa have increased in the past two years. Hello and welcome to the program today. I'm Layo Olarinde. We begin in East Africa. Investigation is underway into a helicopter crash that killed Kenya's military chief Francis Ogola. The government has sent a team of investigators to the crash site where General Ogola and nine others were killed. General Ogola was among 12 occupants of the military air aircraft that went down on Thursday afternoon, shortly after takeoff in the northwest of the country. Two of the occupants who survived the crash are said to be receiving medical attention in hospital. President William Ruto has announced three days of mourning, calling it a moment of great sadness for the country. General Ogola first joined the Kenya Defense Forces on April 24, 1984. He was due to mark 40 years in the military next week. Well, let's get more on this story. Joining us now is Cyrus Mbati, Kenyan journalist in Nairobi. Uh, hello, Cyrus. Thank you so much for your time. A time of great sadness. The president has called it for the country. What more can you tell us about the investigations that are going on into the crash? Thank you for having me in the show. What we understand is that uh, the team in the city of the matter went on to view to the site today. Uh, as part of the investigation to establish what happened exactly um, before and after the, the crash. But then as they were there, we understand there was an attack in the area because the area is a, is a banished zone area. And there was an attack in the area, but then it had, it had nothing to do with the, with the investigation. The team visited the site, visited the, the, the record, which was banned, or in banned, and uh, they are going back to now to do their preliminary report and what they found out to establish what happened. They are not sure like what happened, but we expect to have a now, of the 12 people on board, uh, two people survived. What do we know of their condition at this time? They're receiving medical treatment at the hospital. Yeah, actually, one of them is going to me. I talked to him and he says that uh, oh, the fact that he didn't have a belt on him, he, he says he didn't have a belt on him that's how he managed to survive because that. Uh, on the impact of the, 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 the chopper, he was thrown out of the chopper, that's how he survived. The other one is in the ICU, and there is a still in the medical treatment. And so far, we wait to see whether he survived or not. But he had some bands on his body, which are life for them. That's why he's in our, in our ICU. All right, uh, Cyrus, we understand General Gola, you know, was due to mark 40 years in the military next week, but uh, that wouldn't happen now. Talk to us about his legacy and what Kenya would miss about him. Actually, uh, he said that uh, General Gola was a pilot. He was, he was enlisted in the military in 1984, as he was said in Chile. He, was, he rose the rank from uh, being a candidate to be the, the general of uh, the the military in Kenya. He was a man who was going to be, he wanted to have peace in the region. He was always, he was not confrontational. He cared for the wealth of the soldiers, for the general officers, the military. He always, that's why you see, he was flying to the area alone, personally, because uh, the job he was doing was more basically for a service commander, probably for uh, the Kenyan family or the other juniors, but he, he chose to go there personally to kind of a uh, the process of the project beyond in the region. So the military was a shock. The Kenyan tribe was a shock. Even the president himself, he, he says he never he never believed when he was told the war was no more. Up to now, it's a shock. So Kenyans are still born. We are waiting to see now what happens next for the next thing is the body. All right, then, Kenyan um, journalist uh, Cyrus Sombati, thank you so much for your time.
Well, we're still in East Africa. Heavy rains and flooding is wreaking havoc across the region, claiming lives and displacing thousands of people in Kenya and Tanzania. In Kakola, Umbaka, that's in Kenya, officials report that 646 households have been displaced, with hundreds seeking refuge in evacuation centers or with relatives on higher ground. The situation is dire across the region, with Kenya reporting at least 13 fatalities from flooding, while Tanzania has recorded over 50 deaths in the past two weeks alone. Authorities are urging residents in flood-prone areas to relocate as the rains persist. The Kenyan Meteorological Department had issued warnings about the impending heavy rainfall, urging preparedness for potential floods. Even as the region braces for further rainfall, the plight of those affected by the floods underscores the urgent need for coordinated disaster response efforts to mitigate the impact on vulnerable communities. To the south now, South Africa's renowned economist Gabriel Cruz says South Africa has many problems, big problems, and might follow in Zimbabwe's footsteps. Mr. Cruz highlights issues such as the expropriation bill, which allows the government to take property without compensation, and poor state-owned institutions. He explained that there are many reasons why South Africa might become another Zimbabwe. Is South Africa going to become like Zimbabwe? Well, maybe and maybe not. It's ultimately going to be up to us as South Africans to decide, but I'm worried and here's why. The South African Parliament just a couple of weeks ago passed the expropriation bill, which allows the government to take property without compensation in a range of circumstances, including where people own the property and their primary interest is in selling it later at a profit. That's exactly the kind of legal change that was made in Venezuela before 21st century socialism collapsed the economy, destroyed democracy, and caused most Venezuelans either to flee or to, or to literally go hungry. The second law that I'm worried about is called the Land Court Bill. If that's passed into law, it will basically turn the courts into kangaroo courts because it allows people who aren't judges to rule on matters of fact in land disputes. And it allows hearsay evidence to, to play a decisive role. The third bill is the unlawful entering on premises bill, which is like a new trespass law, which effectively says that a mob can, in some people's interpretation, enter a property, whether it's a town property or a thing in the countryside, because they believe that they've got a historical justice reason to be there. Combine that with things like Julius Malema, the EFF leader, uh, standing in a stadium full of people chanting, kill the boer, kill the farmer, encouraging people to go and do land invasions. And the picture that you get is exactly what happened in Zimbabwe in 2000, which is where mobs of people were encouraged to go and take farms from an uh, unpopular group, uh, white rich people. And then the government came in afterwards and said, well, we're going to take the title deed as well, and then we're going to give these farms to the people by actually giving it to rich connected uh, government officials and the economy collapsed but you know what else collapsed democracy we did an international study in every case in africa in asia in europe in the americas in every single case where the government was able to take the property of some people some unpopular group it was also able to take away the votes of some people who those who wanted to vote for the opposition a small group uh, the worry is that that's going to happen in South Africa too. Hunger levels in Africa has increased in the past two years due to lingering effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, the ongoing conflicts, climate change and economic shocks. This is according to Q Dongyu, the Director General of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Speaking at the opening of the 33rd session of the FAO Regional Ministerial Conference for Africa, he says the continent's possibilities are vast and optimism about the opportunities that lie ahead is in order despite the many challenges. Hunger in Africa has increased, driven largely by ongoing effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, economic shocks, climate crisis, and ongoing conflicts. We are meeting at the critical moment which requires our aging and collective action. 
Despite the many challenges, we rem I remain optimistic about the opportunities that uh, lie ahead. Africa boasts the largest area of Arab land of any continent and is uh, bound in the natural resource. It is through the transformation of Africa, agro-system transformation, that we can unlock the benefit across food, security, and nutrition, economic equality, environment, and the resilience. The age need for agro system transformation is essential to the discussion this, at this regional ministerial conference and the FO strategy framework 2022 to 31 is a roadmap towards the more efficient, more inclusive, more resilient, and more sustainable agro systems for better production, better nutrition, a better environment, a better life living on behind. Health officials attending the Russia-Africa Infectious Disease Conference taking place in Kampala, Uganda, say they are learning best practices from Russia on combating these diseases. The representative from Namibia's Health Ministry, Iyalu Manangingwe, says many of the healthcare professionals were trained in Russia providing technical support. In terms of the collaboration between the African countries, I think we have uh, observed over the past decades a close collaboration in terms of infectious diseases, uh, especially when it comes to the capacity building, uh, strengthening the infrastructure like the laboratory, the data. And Russia has been in the forefront, even historically supporting um, countries like Namibia and others. Most of our healthcare professionals, many of our healthcare professionals actually were trained in Russia, uh, they have been providing uh, technical support to many of our countries in terms of management of infectious diseases. With the Russian public health institutes or entities, uh, there are opportunities for us also to gain on how they have been managing infectious conditions. Um, we have seen presentation of how they've been managing plague, smallpox, and also in the area of biosafety and biosecurity, I think we can collaborate uh, and learn from each other. It's actually a very good scientific experience for me, personally, because uh, being here, uh, I've been listening to, to, to experience from countries coming from Mozambique, especially in the province of Cap Delgado, where we have uh, an insurgency ongoing. It's always a chance for, uh, to collect more experiences and uh, to see how other people are dealing with the with such problems in their countries and uh, maybe replicate the same experience in, uh, in, in, in our countries, in our own countries, yes. Still to come on the program. Our Africa Tech segment focuses on providing financial services to the underserved and excluded women in Africa. More details after the break. Please join us again. Welcome to our Africa Tech segment. Nigeria's federal government says it's making substantial investments in training Nigerians to become AI experts, aiming to position Nigerians at the forefront of global AI technology development. The Minister of Communications, Innovation and Digital Economy, Mr. Bosun Tijani, revealed this initiative during a national workshop on artificial intelligence strategy held in Abuja. According to him, the talent pool of Nigerian origin in the AI field shows promising quality, indicating that Nigeria is poised to lead the way in the technological advancement of artificial intelligence in the coming years. Our position is to ensure that our voices are represented in the development of this technology globally. And I want to remind us, we're not far behind. The world at the minute when it comes to artificial intelligence is diverging. The U.S. has its own perspective to how AI should be developed and regulated. The Europeans have their approach to how it should be developed and regulated. The Asians have many approaches to how it should be developed and regulated. So even as we start to think of the African way, we must show leadership. 
let's not imagine that we can't show global leadership because there's nowhere in the world where AI is going to be based on divergent views. What we're seeing today is the reality that countries are still grappling with it. So there's a lot of silos in the way people are thinking about AI. But I can assure you that in the next three to four, five years, there will be convergence. And why do we need to wait until that convergence starts to start to give leadership to it? And this is what I'm challenging each and every one of us that will participate in this workshop, not to be too focused on strategies and thinking around AI that is limited to Africa or Nigeria, that our focus should be thinking about what a good AI will be for the world. From target savings to investments and credits specifically for women farmers, Nigerian fintech startup Hervest is providing financial services for underserved and excluded women in Africa. Part of the goal of the inclusive fintech platform is to close the economic gender gap through financial literacy, mentorship and access to finance. Like, so we don't have an extra screen as well. So. This inclusive fintech company is on a mission to close the gender finance gap, hindering the economic empowerment of women in agriculture. In an effort to rewrite the narrative, they are empowering smallholder women farmers and traders with access to savings, investments and credit, thereby breaking down barriers that have constrained the potential of these women. We provide women access to um, savings and investments as well as credits. So um, what we do is we have two types of customers. We have the supply side and we have the demand side. So the supply side are users that would use our mobile app to you know, save, invest. And the investing is more or less impact investment. And this impact investment goes to um, underserved women in rural areas which are notably smallholder female farmers, as well as women leading micro enterprises. The women that use our mobile applications actually invest in women in rural areas by putting in their funds. So these women can use this money to you know, farm as well as run their businesses, micro enterprises. Nigeria envisions becoming Africa's breadbasket, but faces a 20 to 30 percent gender gap in financial inclusion, especially in agriculture, and that's according to the World Bank Group. Despite their vital contributions, women farmers produce 30 percent less per hectare than their male counterparts, mainly due to limited access to land, seeds, fertilizers, and mechanization. I realized that there was a challenge, and the big challenge was that a lot of women were not consuming financial services, even across board, even at banking, which is meant to be like the basics of financial services. And um, of course, this was due to many reasons that, you know, I cannot exactly sweat here, but they are largely due to our societal constructs, the patriarchy itself, and a lot of women feeling like finance is a man thing and they can afford to sit back and not consume it. Um, because when you look at trade, when you look at the market, the farms, women constitute more, they contribute a lot of activities, you know, in making money. But between making money, saving it, and then ultimately investing it, something breaks for women due to financial education, due to... Um, you know, um, lack of access to easier tools that is custom to their um, daily living because a lot of women, if you look at it, are actually time poor, right? So there are just so many factors, as I've said, that are varied. And we decided to start Harvest that would build the face of financial services that does not leave any woman behind, regardless of their income, economic background, creed or age. Through a blended finance model, Hervest is revolutionizing agriculture financing, providing vital resources and training to marginalized smallholder women farmers. It's not, it's not, it's not going to be business as usual. That's, not, that's what we've realized. So what we do is we deploy custom solutions to custom groups of women, savings and impact investment to some, credits to some, and then we offer this in a peer-to-peer -peer lending model. By leveraging digital technology and a peer-to-peer -peer model that connects women farmers with the much-needed capital and resources, Hervest is not only closing the gender finance gap, but also leveling the playing field for women in agriculture.
However, this also poses challenges for the niche company. One of our major challenges has been the fact that we're a niche product and we're for women. And um, uh, we are sidelining like half of the population, more or less. Um, so, but what we're trying to preach is inclusivity, which means that we're not actually excluding men, but we're making men allies to empower women financially. We give these women access to funds so that they can run their businesses effectively. And we also give women on the other side of the divide that have access to funds, but don't know where to invest it as well. For Harvest, the journey has just begun a movement towards a more inclusive and equitable Africa. The vision was clear from day one, but every day, this morning, tomorrow, everything keeps you know, getting better in, forms of, in terms of strategy. So when we started, we started with just the savings part of the business and the credits, for instance. But over time, now we have group savings, now we have impact investments, now we have, you know, varying you know, um, um, types of offerings on the products. And over time, the product too has expanded from just being available on mobile application alone to being available on web application and to being available on USSD. As this fintech company continues to empower women, the ripple effect of its initiatives are felt as it paves the way for a future where gender equality flourishes. Now, Africans living in the United Arab Emirates are trying to cope with the reality on ground, even as the country earlier this week witnessed heavy rains and flooding. It's bracing up now for more rains in the coming week, even as weather agencies forecast more showers. Residents and government agencies are rallying together to bring normalcy to the tourist city of Dubai. Our correspondent, Mayowa Adegoki, has more. Dubai is returning to normal, three days after a storm brought in a year's worth of rain upon the United Arab Emirates in 24 hours, causing shocking scenes of never-before-seen floods in many parts of the country. So many cars were submerged. There were people climbing up on their uh, car roofs because they couldn't access couldn't drive the car and if they were going to stay inside the car possibly uh, they could drown so we saw so many people getting out of their cars and climbing up on top of the roof uh, we saw so many rescue vehicles i didn't expect that it would get this bad it was really horrible it was like a whole shutdown i remember during COVID when everything shut down uh even though it came gradually this one was a total shutdown in a country that I felt were very well prepared for disaster, you know. So coming to see that this was happening was really, really something I did not expect. Harry was one of many residents caught in the storm Tuesday night as he tried to make his way to the Dubai airport with a friend traveling to Kenya. Dubai airport was not spared from the downpour and had announced suspension of activities on Wednesday after over 1,000 flights had either been diverted or cancelled. Activities are yet to return to normal as thousands are stranded and waiting to be boarded onto their respective flights. So I just landed in Munich now. I was meant to travel Thursday midnight. So when is the slash Thursday midnight? But because of the, um, the rainstorm and the flood, um, the flight was rescheduled and I got to travel on Thursday evening. Dubai is recovering, some areas faster than others. In some parts of the city, vehicles are still submerged on the water. Houses are still flooded and out of power. Insurance expert Neeraj Gupta says the damage to property has been unprecedented and insurance companies are being flooded with claims requests. The government way in advance informed about the expected situation, right? Uh, so a lot of schools were already shut. Uh, government officers were moved to work from home. A lot of private officers were recommended to work from home. And as a result, if uh, you were given enough warning, then still you took out a car and you could see there was water in front and you thought, I'll just drive through it. The chances are this this is not going to be covered, right? 
uh, the people who had their cars parked at their villas, apartment buildings or somewhere. And that is where the water got in. That obviously should be covered if it's a comprehensive policy. Uh, but if you took a chance and drove your car through a puddle of water or when you could see the, uh, the water was uh, way high and you thought you'll drive through it, the chances are you're going to get claimed is very negligible. However, residents are rising up to the occasion with several community-led initiatives offering information on passable roads, emergencies or shelter homes and rendering assistance where needed. From Dubai in the United Arab Emirates, Maya Wadigoke for Channel's Television News. And that's it on the program today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Layo Olarede. Have a lovely weekend.